This is the most horrific crime that I had ever seen. The case that cannot be forgotten. Oh, God. <laughs> On August 28, 2014, 32-year-old Timothy Ray Jones Jr. committed an unthinkable act. Now, this next case is very unique, both in terms of its details and the legal question on mental illness. In their family mobile home on South Lake Drive in Red Bank, New Jersey, Timothy took the lives of his five children, aged one to eight. What could have caused this father to kill his own children? Red Bank is a neighborhood in Monmouth County in the U.S. state of New Jersey. The Navasink River, the region's traditional means of transit to the ocean and other ports, runs through the community which was incorporated in 1908. Red Bank is a commuter town for New York City and is located in the metropolitan area of New York. The borough has a population of 12,936 as of the 2020 United States Census. It was in this neighborhood that five young children met their end in the most horrific manner in August 2014. Timothy Jones Jr. was born in 1981 to Timothy Jones Sr. and Cindy Jones, who was 16 at the time of her pregnancy. Sadly, Cindy left the house when Jones Jr. was only 18 months old. Following this, Timothy Jones Sr. remarried. Growing up, Jones Jr. faced legal trouble in 2001 when he was arrested in Illinois on charges of possessing cocaine, forging checks, and car theft. Despite being sentenced to seven years in prison, he was released in 2003 after serving just two years. After this, his life seemed to take a turn for the better. He and Amber Kaiser had met as teenagers, and they got married in 2004. They soon had three children. Jones continued his education, eventually getting an engineering degree and graduating from Mississippi State University. The young family later moved to Blythewood, seeking better opportunities of life. By 2014, they had five children who were eight-year-old Mara Gracie, seven-year-old Elias, six-year-old Nathan, two-year-old Gabrielle, and one-year-old Abigail Elaine. As time went on, their marriage began to falter, and Jones' behavior changed drastically as he turned to drinking, smoking, and using synthetic marijuana. Amidst these challenges, Amber gave birth to their last child, Abigail Elaine. However, Jones had doubts about whether he was the father of the child, due to this and other problems in their marriage. Jones and Amber got divorced in 2013. After the divorce, Jones won custody of the children. Tim and I had a lot of good times. It just becomes a point when things are volatile that you just make a choice. Where your young children aren't seeing certain things, it, it's affecting them at a point. And you make a choice to separate yourself from that person. And it's hard to separate yourself from that person because that's all you've known. All I knew from 19 was Tim. It was expected that Jones would be the model father and give his all to protect his children. But who could have predicted the horror that would come later? On Thursday, August 28, 2014, Jones picked up his three older children from school and the two youngest from their babysitter. He vanished the very next day. Jones and the children were gone for several days, prompting his family to reach out to the police but only after they were unable to get in touch with him for several days. At 9.36 a.m. the next day, the babysitter Elk tried reaching him on the phone, but received no response. Unfazed, Elk decided to text Jones at 9.38, inquiring about dropping off the youngest children at daycare. Jones responded, Don't worry about this morning. I'll see you next week. He assured her that the children would return on Tuesday, the day following Memorial Day. Meanwhile, Jones's grandmother, Roberta Thornsbury, desperately tried to reach him from Mississippi, but he declined her calls. On August 30th, Thornsbury grew increasingly concerned and sent a series of texts to Jones throughout the day, finally questioning him at 5.13 p.m. about his unresponsiveness. At 4.54 p.m., Elk gently reminded Jones to bring diapers when dropping off Gabriel and Abigail Elaine on September 1st. Later at 6.15 p.m., he made a call to Elk revealing his intentions to leave South Carolina with the children and start afresh. He asked Elk to clean up his mobile home and offered her whatever she wanted from the things he left behind. At 7 p.m., a call from Amber came in, but Jones didn't answer. Tim, I'm not, I'm not calling to argue or anything. I just, 
So, like, the past two or three phone calls, you've been, like, really on edge. You're saying you're, like, coming off really frustrated or whatever. And I was just concerned about you, so. Please call. I'm not, not calling to argue or anything. His family reached out to the police as they couldn't reach him. A nationwide alert was released looking for Jones and indicated that he was missing and traveling with his five children. But it wouldn't be until September 6th that they received news on his whereabouts. On September 6, 2014, a routine traffic safety stop in Smith County, Mississippi led to a shocking discovery. Tim Jones Jr. was detained at around 7 p.m. Under Sheriff Marty Patterson went to the scene around 8 p.m. He noticed that Jones showed signs of intoxication as he approached Jones's car. An Escalade emitted a foul stench. Bleach stains along the baseboard caught Patterson's attention. Running Jones' ID and license plate revealed an alarming hit from the FBI's National Crime Information Center, indicating that Jones was supposed to be traveling from Lexington with his five children. Patterson immediately contacted the Lexington County Sheriff's Department. We did advise you of your, your rights, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, can you just state your name? Tim Jones. When questioned about his children, Jones initially denied having any, but when pressed further, he claimed to have only three children in South Carolina. Smith County investigators promptly reached out to Jones's father, Tim Jones Sr., who then informed Jones's grandmother, Roberta Thornsberry, and Amber, Jones's ex-wife. On September 8, 2014, investigative officers from the Lexington County Sheriff's Department and SLED arrived in Mississippi to delve into the case. Two days later, on September 9th, Jones agreed to lead investigators to the bodies of his children. The discovery unfolded on September 10th, when the bodies of Marag Gracie, Elias, Nathan, Gabriel, and Abigail Elaine were recovered. The evidence collected from Jones's Escalade on September 11th was disturbing and haunting. Among the items logged were family photos, clothing, drawings made by the children, letters to the children penned by their mother, Amber, Bibles, Tim Jones's diploma from Mississippi State University, and his passport. Equally chilling were handwritten notes by Timothy Jones, containing lists of disturbing tasks, such as melt bodies, sand bones to dust or small pieces, and burn up bodies. The list also included items needed for these horrifying acts, such as camping supplies, gas, and M. Acid. It seemed unbelievable that this father had meticulously planned to kill and dispose of the bodies of all five of his children. On September 13, 2014, Jones was booked into Kirkland Correctional Facility, where he was placed in solitary confinement, away from the general population. But what had transpired on that fateful day? Why did Jones kill the children, and what prompted him to hide their bodies? Jones's confession and the police's investigation led them to the dark truth of what Jones did in the week when he disappeared with his children. The afternoon of Thursday, August 28, 2014, set the stage for the chilling chain of events. Tim Jones picked up his three older children from school and retrieved his two youngest from the babysitter. Little did anyone know that this seemingly ordinary day would take a nightmarish turn. Before 7 p.m., a storm of anger engulfed the family's mobile home. Jones confronted his six-year-old son, Nathan, about damaged power outlets. He beat Nathan and subjected the child to a punishing physical ordeal. Jones went further to rain down a barrage of questions on the young child. At 7.10 p.m., there was a phone call from his estranged wife, Amber. Nathan, in fear and distress, revealed that the incident had been an accident. But Jones intervened, accusing Amber of protecting their son before abruptly ending the conversation. As the evening wore on, the darkness deepened. Nathan was sent to bed, and Amber's desperate attempts to reach out went unanswered. The details here were unclear, but around 8.30 p.m., Jones either discovered Nathan's lifeless body or attempted to ruse the boy to no avail. Jones faced the grim reality that his child was gone forever. Jones, seemingly triggered by his own imagination, would later claim to the authorities that Nathan was trying to harm him through the mobile home's electricity. This paranoia pushed him to kill his children. In the early hours of the following day, Jones took his eight-year-old daughter, Mara, to a convenience store to buy cigarettes. Upon returning home, a wave of violence consumed him. In his confession to the authorities, 
Jones admitted to choking Marat and Elias, aged eight and seven, with his bare hands, while using a belt to end the lives of Gabriel and Abigail Elaine. He then wrapped the bodies of his children in sheets and blankets from their beds, before placing them in the back seat of his vehicle. The authorities also went through Jones's search history and revealed an unusual interest in herbal incense and Atlanta. It became apparent that Jones was on the hunt for spice, a synthetic marijuana that happened to be legal in South Carolina but banned in Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. Determined to get his hands on the substance, he scoured the internet for smoke shops or head shops across state borders. Around this time, he also declined calls from his grandmother, who he had made prior plans with. She had left up to 23 calls and texts. Tracking data suggested Jones's presence near Moody, Alabama at 2.20 p.m. In the late afternoon, between 3 and 5 p.m., Jones continued his search for smoke shops, this time focusing on Alabama and Mississippi. As the day progressed, Jones's location hopped from Lithium Springs, Georgia at 8.04 p.m. to Washington, Georgia at 10.29 p.m. It was clear that he was covering considerable ground. By August 30th, the location of Jones's phone indicated that he was in Red Bank. By August 31st, the search queries on Jones's phone revealed his plans to start anew. He looked up camping options in South Carolina, dumps in Lexington County, and animal services. On September 1st, a store receipt found in Jones's vehicle put him in Athens, Georgia. Surprisingly, data from his phone also indicated his presence in Spartansburg and Winsboro. At 1.20 a.m. that same day, the phone's location switched to Folly Beach. The situation took a darker turn on September 2nd at 10.35 a.m. When Jones conducted a series of concerning Google searches, he looked up body in landfill, muriatic acid burn, camping near Columbia, South Carolina, what does no extradition laws mean, and facing legal problems, where should you run? The phone was traced to West Columbia between 11 a.m. and noon. Jones and Elk exchanged texts about arrangements to clean his Red Bank mobile home. At 11.54 a.m., Jones's boss, Intel, Jim McConnell, reached out to inquire about his absence from work. Additionally, there were unanswered calls from Sachs Gotha School regarding Marah, Elias, and Nathan around 1.30 p.m. The situation escalated as an unanswered call from McConnell followed at 1.53 p.m. The phone's location was further traced to Clinton, South Carolina at 3.22 p.m., Athens, Georgia at 4.19 p.m., and Lawrenceville, Georgia at 6.04 p.m. Throughout this tumultuous day, Jones ignored two calls from Amber at 6 p.m. and received an update call from Elk at 10.08 p.m. By September 3rd, the situation had grown concerning. Jones missed two calls in an unanswered text from Kevin McKinney, a co-worker at Intel, at 10.07 a.m. Additionally, his boss call at 12.11 p.m. went unanswered too. Surveillance footage from various locations on September 3rd spotted Jones at the Augusta Road Walmart in Lexington, an advanced auto store in Lake City, and a Dollar General in Orangeburg. Disturbingly, the Walmart footage showed him purchasing items like a saw, saw blades, muriatic acid, garbage bags, a five-gallon bucket, and goggles. On September 4th at 3.37 a.m., when the phone powered on again, Jones googled missing children Tim Jones, and the phone was traced to James Island, near Charleston. Later that day, Thornsbury and Sachs got this text went unanswered, and Jones's phone was traced to Camden and then Orangeburg at 5.17 p.m. At 6.33 p.m., Jones was spotted using the Augusta Road ATM in Lexington, depositing a check for $3,518.49. This money revealed to be proceeds from Intel stock he sold weeks prior. The climax occurred on September 6. Jones would reveal to the authorities that he placed the decomposing bodies of his children in black plastic garbage bags along a logging road between Greenville and Camden, Alabama. The bodies had been in the back seat of his vehicle since August 29, 2014. At 9.14 a.m., the phone was located in Greenville, Alabama. Receipts and surveillance video from the same day showed Jones at the Bypass Food Mart in Camden, Alabama at 1.06 p.m. It is unusual for a father to commit such an act. This made the authorities seek to understand what pushed Tim to kill the children. Hence, an investigation was launched to verify his mental state. In the wake of his incarceration, mental health professionals closely examined Tim Jones Jr.'s psychological state. 
Clinical and forensic psychiatrists and psychologists were involved in the evaluation, but there were disagreement among them regarding his diagnosis. While others suggested he may have a schizoaffective disorder or a personality disorder, Additionally, they debated whether his mental state during the crime could have been influenced by the use of synthetic marijuana or if a traumatic brain injury he suffered at age 15 played a role in underlying psychosis. These varying theories were presented to the jury during the trial. To shed light on the roots of Tim Jones Jr.'s mental state, the history of the Jones family spanning three generations was diagrammed and explored. The aim was to understand how a turbulent environment and a familial background mental illness could have impacted Tim Jr.'s mental health. During the trial, the jury learned about the circumstances surrounding the conception and birth of Tim Jones Sr. Roberta Thornsbury, Tim Sr.'s mother, had been assaulted by her stepfather, leading to her pregnancy at just 12 years old. Surprisingly, Tim Jr.'s mother, Cynthia, also had a family history of mental illness. Tim Jr. was born when the young couple were barely out of their teens. However, their relationship turned volatile, leading to Cynthia's attempt to take Tim Jr. away from his father. Ultimately, Tim Sr. gained custody, and as a result, Tim Jr. was raised by his grandmother, Roberta Thornsbury. Meanwhile, Tim Sr. had Cynthia confined to a mental hospital in New York after she was diagnosed with schizophrenia. These intricate family dynamics were presented as evidence to help the jury comprehend the complex web of factors that may have contributed to Tim Jones Jr.'s mental state. Thornberry's marriage had its fair share of woes. Numerous incidences of the marriage involved calls to the police for shootings, stabbings, drug possession, and physical and alcohol abuse. The environment seemed anything but stable. As the years passed, Tim Sr. went through multiple marriages, divorcing Cynthia and marrying Carolyn, with whom he had two more sons. By the time Tim was nine, he found himself in a broken family, and as the years went on, he witnessed his father marrying again, this time to a woman called Julie, when Jones was 16. Upon his release, Jones met Amber and the two got married. Jones had a strained relationship with his father. This escalated during the Christmas holidays of 2012, leading to 18 months of silence between them. The Christmas holiday of 2012 would be the last time that Jones's father would see the children. The trial commenced on May 15, 2019. Testimonies poured in from various individuals, shedding light on the heinous crime committed by Jones. Law enforcement officials, mental health experts, correctional officers, teachers, school administrators, babysitters, and even Jones's own family members took the stand to present their accounts. From the onset, Jones's guilt was undeniable. He had confessed to the crime and the evidence against him was overwhelming. Despite this, the defense sought to establish that the man was severely mentally ill, and thus not entirely responsible for his actions. However, when the jury delivered the guilty verdict, they unequivocally rejected the defense's argument. With guilt established, the focus shifted to determining the appropriate punishment for the murders. During the sentencing phase, the prosecution called on teachers and former babysitters to describe the trauma inflicted upon them by the loss of these innocent children even though they were not biologically related. Their accounts painted a picture of the impact of Jones's actions on those left behind. The defense did not present experts to bolster their case, but they heavily relied on pleas for mercy from Jones's relatives, who advocated for a life sentence instead of death. Amidst the emotionally charged courtroom, Jones's father and grandmother took to the stand, recounting a disturbed adolescence and adulthood of Jones. Their tearful testimonies, however, firmly opposed the idea of him facing the death penalty. On the following day, Amber Kaiser, the mother of the children and Jones's wife, returned to the stand for a second time in the trial. While her first appearance was marked by tears and visible distress, this time she mustered the strength to request mercy for Jones. I pray for Tim all the time. <laughs> I pray. I pray for him often. I pray for his family often. I pray for my family. They didn't even have the opportunity to know them. I can't bring myself to want anybody to die. Despite her own feelings of wanting to inflict harm on him, she acknowledged her children's sentiments and believed that they would not have wanted their father to die. I hope for mercy for you. I pray for you often. And I say that without excusing what he's done. She bravely expressed her willingness to accept whatever decision the jury would reach. 
Solicitor Rick Hubbard delivered the closing arguments for the state in the penalty phase of the Timothy Jones Jr. murder trial. Hubbard confronted the jury, posing the striking question, Would you reserve death for the worst of the worst? Isn't he, pointing at Tim Jones, the worst of the worst? Tim Jones, a man who brutally murdered his five children. As Hubbard continued, he implored the jury to consider the kind of man Jones truly was, a murderer who callously betrayed the trust of his own flesh and blood, robbing them of their precious young lives. Reflecting on Jones's tumultuous childhood, Hubbard acknowledged that amidst the chaos, his family had tried to shield him, recognizing something special in him. Jones's father, despite his own imperfections, had loved his son, and his grandmother had expressed her love for him too though also recognizing his selfish tendencies. Hubbard highlighted how Jones had learned to manipulate his family, knowing that they would always come to him and apologize, reinforcing a sense of entitlement. Hubbard showed two pictures. The first was one of Jones's joyful family, and the second was the children's lifeless bodies wrapped in black garbage bags. Hubbard drove home the point that Jones was responsible for destroying this loving family. He declared, No father does this to his children. Hubbard highlighted that Jones's choices, not his family history, led to the tragic act of leaving his children's bodies exposed. With a display of crime scene and autopsy photos, Hubbard challenged the jury to confront the reality of Jones's actions. Throughout his closing arguments, Hubbard pressed the jury to contemplate whether a man who committed such an unfathomable act deserved mercy. With the weight of the evidence and the gravity of the crime before them, the jury was left to determine the fate of Jones. Jones's attorney, Casey Secor, passionately appealed to the jury's empathy for the Jones family. He prompted them to consider the family's ongoing suffering and heartache. Secor acknowledged the gravity of Jones's actions, urging a balanced decision that respected both severe punishment and compassion. It took the jury just over six hours to find Jones guilty. Despite the gravity of the situation, Jones chose not to testify in his defense during either the guilt or penalty phase. Instead, the courtroom was exposed to a haunting audio confession from 2014 that left no room for doubt. After just an hour and 45 minutes of intense deliberation, the 12-member panel delivered their verdict. The death penalty was not an automatic consequence in this case. The jurors carefully considered any extenuating circumstances before reaching their unanimous decision to condemn Jones to death. All 12 jurors had to be in agreement and signed the verdict form before the judge formally delivered the death sentence. As the Jones family solemnly exited the courthouse, they remained tight-lipped, offering no comment to the press, but this would not be the end of the case. In 2021, two years after receiving a death sentence, Jones sought a new trial and the removal of his death penalty, claiming that the exposure to distressing autopsy photos during the original trial prejudiced jurors against him. Lawyer Robert Dudek argued that Jones, who suffers from schizophrenia, was unfairly judged. The defense contended that the inclusion of gruesome autopsy images skewed the sentencing against Jones and that prosecutors misrepresented the consequences of an insanity plea. These images, taken nine days after the children's deaths, raised concerns about fairness. The defense also objected to excluding expert witness testimony, challenging Jones's mental health and diagnosis. Solicitor Rick Hubbard defended his decision to include the photos, facing criticism from justices for potentially manipulating the jurors' emotions. The court usually permits strong defense arguments in death penalty cases, but concerns were raised about the trial's handling. However, in March 2023, the South Carolina Supreme Court rejected Jones's appeal. The court acknowledged that two errors were made during the trial, but deemed them harmless errors. That didn't warrant overturning the conviction or sentence. The initial mistake was excluding Dr. Adriana Flores' testimony, meant to challenge another doctor's claims about Jones faking mental issues. The court said her input should have been allowed. The second error involved showing disturbing autopsy photos. Despite this, the court noted Jones tried to hide the crime, so the images didn't greatly affect the juror's death penalty decision. We, the jury, in the above entitled case, have found beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following statutory aggravating circumstances to wit two or more persons were murdered by the defendant by act or pursuant to one scheme or course of conduct and the murder of five children 11 years of age or younger now recommend to the court that the defendant timothy r jones jr 
<clears throat> be sentenced to death. The emotions within Jones's family must have been unimaginable. Losing all five children and facing the possibility of Jones's execution must be a heavy burden to bear. The prosecutors and defense attorneys, tasked with debating through the horrors of the case, are surely haunted by the disturbing images and Jones's own confession. And above all, the children's mother, who has endured indescribable pain since that fateful day on August 28, 2014. Would she be able to pick up the pieces and start again? Do you think the death sentence is a suitable punishment for Jones? Or should the jury have gone with a life sentence, given Jones's mental health plea? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Are there any cases you would like us to cover? For more captivating true crime stories, like, share, and subscribe to our channel.